Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, can you hear me at the back? Good stuff, okay, so hello everybody. My name is Matt Woods, I am the technology evangelist uh, for Amazon Web Services. Uh, that means that I get to come and talk to smart people such as yourselves about cloud computing in general, Amazon's cloud platform specifically, and then I can take all of your questions and all of your feedback and I use those to guide our roadmap with our products and service teams uh, back in Seattle. And uh, today I just want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, the backstory uh, to how Amazon got involved in cloud computing, uh, how some of our customers are using some of this stuff, uh, some of our services to build innovative, sustainable businesses. I'm going to talk a little bit about security, and then I'm going to touch on uh, what's next uh, for the cloud. Uh, so uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Amazon Web Services provides scalable infrastructure. Uh, so these are building blocks for building out uh, ultra-scale services on the web. Uh, so compute, storage, database, and all this sort of thing. And a reasonable question uh, that I get asked quite a lot is, what is a bookstore doing selling highly scalable compute and storage and all the rest of it? And the answer is really that um, although we're best known uh, for the Amazon.com bookstore, Amazon is actually just a technology company. Uh, we're engineers that happen to run a bookstore. And Amazon really has uh, three main areas to its business. Uh, Amazon.com, uh, are probably best known for, Amazon.co.uk, .de, .it, .es. Uh, the e-commerce uh, sites that I'm sure you're all familiar with, they make up our consumer business. And just uh, for reference, can you put up your hand if you have an Amazon address for buying uh, DVDs and books and things like that? Pretty much everybody. Awesome. So the good news is you're good to go. Uh, that's all you need uh, to get started uh, up in the cloud. Uh, so we have our consumer business that we're well known for. We also have a seller business. That's the second component. Uh, this allows um, customers to take advantage of some of our operational skills in running e-commerce sites. Uh, we run managed e-commerce platforms for people like Timex and Samsonite. And we also allow individual merchants to sell up on uh, the Amazon.com e-commerce platform uh, to customers that are shopping there anyway. And I'm sure you've seen the Amazon Marketplace, which is individual merchants selling against us on our own website. And it's really the third uh, third area of our business, Amazon Web Services, that I want to talk about uh, today. This is our developer business. Uh, what we call web services has come to be known as, as cloud computing. And uh, over the uh, years of operation of running uh, Amazon.com on our e-commerce platform, Amazon built up a remarkable set of operational skills and uh, the sort of management uh, tools for building out e-commerce and web products at scale. Uh, this is very challenging to do at the scale of Amazon. And uh, we wanted to allow other people uh, to take advantage of some of the, uh, some of the expertise that we built up. So probably about uh, a decade ago, we started out allowing programmatic access uh, to our catalog. Uh, so to the book titles, uh, CD album art, and all the rest of it. And this allowed uh, individual developers to take our programming interfaces and build out uh, very innovative uh, new products. And we saw an unexpected amount of innovation from these developers. They were able to take our metadata and uh, build out uh, additional value for their own products, for their own services, and for their own customers. And uh, we had a sort of blinding flash of the obvious. What would happen if we didn't just allow customers to take advantage of uh, the individual metadata that we had, but what if we took that same programmatic access and applied it back to our operational and management skills of delivering uh, large-scale data centers? And uh, really, that's what we did. That's how Amazon Web Services came about, allowing customers to take advantage of the operational skill of how we run our own data centers by allowing them programmatic API access uh, to compute and storage and all the rest of it. So we're five years young. Uh, we've been doing this about five years. We launched our first service, uh, storage service about five years ago. And we now offer a range of compute, uh, storage, databases, and a collection of ancillary services for automation and support and all the rest of it. Now, there's a couple of core characteristics that each of these services have. And these are important as new businesses start to get up and running, as larger enterprises look to reduce costs and build out additional agility to meet their uh, increasing business challenges uh, in the current market. So the first thing is that no matter whether you're dealing with uh, new compute, whether you're provisioning new storage, all of these services are highly available. And that means that they're available on demand. So you can use your existing Amazon credentials log into our website, and start provisioning as much compute as you need, as much storage as you need straight away. It's all available on demand. You don't need to talk to myself or any of my colleagues in order to be able to get access uh, to this platform. It's all on demand. 
We have programmatic access, as I say. Uh, so whether you're working in Java or Ruby or .NET, you can start accessing uh, these resources uh, like you would any other programmatic resource. And we have full elastic capacity. Uh, so you can build up as much of this as you need. You can have an idea and uh, over coffee and provision all of the infrastructure that you need to actually start working on that idea basically by lunchtime. We work with both uh, Linux and Windows uh, in terms of compute. And we can make these available to you uh, in the minutes time frame. So if you work at a company that is used to six to nine month provision cycles from getting that payment order signed off uh, to actually having uh, physical infrastructure racked and stacked and ready for use, moving to a, a model where you can start provisioning new storage, start provisioning new compute resources in uh, just a couple of minutes uh, is really transformative. We aim to be as low cost as possible. Uh, so uh, this is something that we inherited from our cousins over on the retail side of the business. Operating a cloud computing business is uh, you know, low volume, high margin, just like selling books and all the rest of it. And we really aim to provide these services at a lower cost as possible by improving our own efficiencies. And every time that we improve our efficiencies, we pass those savings back on to the customers. So all of these services is pay as you go. Uh, there's no upfront initial spend. There's no ongoing uh, requirement. There's no contracts or anything like that. Uh, we charge for storage per gigabyte per month. We charge for compute uh, per, basically per core per hour. And uh, you can take advantage of as much or as little of this as you want. Uh, you can spin it up, and that's when you start paying for it. And at the end of the day, you can scale it back down. Uh, you can remove your data, and you stop paying for it. So this moves IT from being a large uh, cost sink for companies uh, to basically being a utility. This is utility computing, utility infrastructure. And just like electricity, uh, where w businesses don't run their own electricity diesel generators anymore, uh, so the cloud acts to remove that overhead, to remove that undifferentiated work of operating a business. Instead of running that diesel generator and hooking it up to your electricity and paying for the whole thing and the engineers to run it, uh, we just provide the compute as you would, uh, and you can have access to it as you would plugging into a wall. Uh, once you have access to it, uh, you can do with it whatever you want. And uh, you only pay for what you use, just like electricity. So when you turn on the light, that's when you start paying for it. Uh, the longer you leave the light on, uh, the more you'll pay. And these tools are designed to be very, very flexible. Uh, so you can bring your existing tools, your existing skill sets uh, with Linux, with Windows, with any type of database, uh, bring that up into the cloud, and the platform grows with you. And these three areas are really, I think, what defines uh, modern cloud computing. The availability, both in terms of programmatic access, elasticity, and also low cost, and the flexibility of being able to bring your existing tools and basically run whatever architecture, whatever platform you want uh, up in the cloud. So uh, how are things going? Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of customers across 190 countries. Uh, we have a storage service called S3, the simple storage service. And I pulled out some data uh, for you. Uh, this is the latest data uh, of the number of objects that we store in our storage service. Uh, so objects are really just files. Uh, so this is, uh, you can see the numbers from Q4 2006 all the way through to Q4 2010. And the latest numbers are for Q3 2011. Where we're currently storing 556 billion objects uh, in S3. So this is a high scale service. And uh, I'm no mathematician, but I know exponential growth when I see it. And I'm not sure that we've reached the, uh, the hockey stick inflection point uh, for this service yet. And in terms of access, these objects are being accessed at 370,000 peak transactions per second. This is a very high scale service that a lot of customers are using to build out new innovative businesses. So how can these services really benefit you? Uh, I could talk about technology and eventual consistency all day long. And I encourage you, if you want to talk about that, to find me later on. But I think what's really interesting is how the cloud drives innovation. So we have an idea that we want to turn into a product. We want to get it out there either for internal customers or external customers. We want to build a new website, a new mobile app. Um, and this move from an idea to a product is uh, incredibly difficult uh, for a lot of customers. And it's really IT and infrastructure which provides the majority of friction of moving from an idea to a product, particularly if that product is going to go out to millions of customers, particularly if you don't know how many customers that product is going to reach, which is often the case in social gaming, social networks, and all the rest of it. So IT is starting to act as friction. There's a huge amount of heavy lifting. And uh, when we started to look at this internally, we spotted about 70% of our developer team's time was spent just worrying about how to distribute 
uh, assets to a lot of people, how to scale up and take advantage of some of the, uh, take advantage of the business opportunities that were presenting themselves as and when they did. And this is heavy lifting that is, uh, is undifferentiated. Uh, there's no additional business value in figuring out how to rack and stack disks, having uh, racking and stacking servers. What you want is the 30% of the time here that's really spent on adding additional business value, you want to maximize that. And that's what we see when uh, customers start to work with these infrastructure services, that we invert the amount of time that think people are spending on this undifferentiated work, and they move from spending it on uh, uh, activities which add really no business value uh, to uh, spending 70% of their time really focusing on driving additional value uh, for their own business and for their own customers. So IT's promise, the promise of IT has always been to facilitate these sort of businesses to build out sustainable models for businesses, to build out um, uh, infrastructure which can grow as businesses grow, and to allow greater levels of innovation. But we've ended up at a point where IT, st statically provisioned IT, actually acts as just friction. It can become a blocker of moving from your idea to a product, and uh, we'll investigate some of the reasons why, that's, uh, why that happens uh, in a minute. So at AWS, we want to remove this overhead as much as possible uh, to a point which makes sense for your business. And we want to ultimately move your idea closer to your product. That's what drives us. That's what gets us up in the morning. Uh, so the technology is interesting, uh, but how people use it uh, is really what drives us. So the goal is to move people from worrying about running that diesel generator, from racking and stacking disks, to worrying about tolerance on disks, to focusing more on their core competency, which is typically their customers, and remove this undifferentiated heavy lifting to spend the time that they would have spent worrying about data center cooling and push that into a place where they can worry about uh, adding additional value, driving innovation, and reaching their new business opportunities. So it is a cost-effective solution, um, but what it really gains businesses is a huge amount of agility. Uh, they spend much less time building out large-scale infrastructure, uh, which they may not need, and much more time innovating on behalf of their customers. So this is the challenge, when you, whether you are a new startup uh, whether you are a larger enterprise in dealing with infrastructure. These are the key points, I think, of friction. These are the things that stop you innovating, that stop you delivering additional business value. Uh, the first is that you typically have really spiky requirements. Now, this is true whether you're building out uh, a platform for hosting user-generated video, uh, whether you're hosting a uh, review site, whether you want to provide recommendations, whether you're doing technical and scientific computing, uh, very, very spiky requirements. You don't know what you're going to need further down the line. You have very unpredictable usage and very unpredictable distribution volumes. Very common in social gaming. Uh, you typically require a large upfront investment, uh, which is obviously uh, goes out of, uh, out of line with these spiky requirements and unknown requirements down the line. And once you've built that large-scale infrastructure to meet your spiky requirements, you typically have a low utilization the majority of the time. Now, with the cloud, we try and turn these things on their head. So we take IT as a limiter to innovation and try and provide it as an enabler. So we move from having just spiky requirements to providing elastic capacity. So if you'll uh, forgive my uh, business school 101 graph here, uh, this is typically what we try and do, what customers do when they're starting to plan their capacity. So here we have a graph of capacity against time. And based on some prediction of future capacity, customers typically start to build out uh, the infrastructure that they're going to need based on some prediction, some guess further down the line. And this green line here represents the capacity of their infrastructure. And you can see that every time we reach the, uh, the limit of our prediction, we have to spend more money. We have to make a capital investment into our infrastructure to increase our capacity. And over on the left-hand side here, there's a, quite a large barrier of entry just to getting started. Now, this barrier to entry is, uh, is a real killer if you're a startup. If you want to do something really innovative, uh, if you want to deliver maximum value, uh, if you want to drive additional recommendations, if you want to drive more music, this barrier to entry can stop you doing any of that because you can't get the capital to invest to build out the infrastructure. And that's just crazy. The really big problem, though, however, comes as you start to run. The problem is that real demand doesn't look anything like your estimation. It goes up, it goes down, and you have these spiky inflection points. Now, this can be at any scale. This could be the point where you're doing moving from development and test to running in production. This could be a global rollout, or this could just be uh, Monday morning at 9 o'clock in the morning 
when everybody starts to use your service. This could be uh, lunchtime on Friday when everybody starts to play uh, a social game on a, a social network. And this real demand is obviously out of whack. So over here on the left-hand side, where demand is beneath your capacity, these are disks that are not spinning. These are servers that are not serving. This is uh, money that you have invested, valuable money that you've invested, particularly if you're a startup, uh, which is just being wasted. And over on the right-hand side here, as demand starts to outstrip your capacity, which can happen very, very quickly if you're doing anything in uh, television or uh, having viral lift uh, all of a sudden, whether it's a, a blog post uh, or a game you're working on, this is opportunity cost. This is the point at which uh, your business cannot deliver your product to your, your service uh, to your customers. And that's just crazy. With elastic capacity, we can more accurately mirror uh, what it is that you need. So your capacity can very quickly echo uh, your real demand. So you can increase. And remember, down here now, we're starting at zero. So all of our customers start out at, at zero. And you can start to increase. So the barrier to entry is completely gone. And you only increase your infrastructure as demand starts to increase. And here, when we get a reach an inflection point, as we'll see, uh, customers can scale up to take advantage of the, the scale of the Amazon platform. So that's elastic capacity. Now, how do we deal with this unpredictability of the usage? Well, we have this highly scalable infrastructure. I want to tell you just uh, two really quick stories about how people are taking advantage of this. Uh, so uh, Netflix, uh, if you're not familiar, these guys do uh, DVDs through the post. Uh, over in the US, and they typically move into a video on demand model. Uh, they have a huge number of titles. So they had around 17,000 titles, and they needed to transcode these uh, in order to support the launch of the Sony PS3. Uh, so this is a very spiky requirement. They didn't know exactly when it was going to land, they knew they had a lot of work to do, and they didn't know when they were going to have to do it. Uh, so they just provisioned uh, 1,200 uh, instances, what we call instances, uh, you may call servers. They provisioned 1,200 of those, and they completed the transcoding process uh, in just a couple of days. And they were 100% ready for the PS3 launch when it arrived. So this is really enabling for Netflix, and it can be enabling for any startup. So any business can take advantage of this. And you can see just how spiky and unpredictable this usage is. So I thank Netflix uh, for sharing this data with us. Uh, they had to obfuscate it a little bit. So again, this is a capacity graph. Uh, over several months uh, and uh, moving up to many thousands of uh, instances or servers that they're running against. And you can see just how spiky that content encoding usage is. Uh, it starts very, very low. It can drop to zero, essentially. And then it can scale all the way up to many, many thousands of instances. So this is summer 2010. Uh, production usage is much higher now. And Netflix are moving all of their infrastructure onto the Amazon cloud. Likewise, uh, these guys really were a startup. And they really embody a lot of the uh, enabling power of the cloud. So Animoto, if you're not familiar with them, uh, Animoto is a great service. Uh, they take um, your photos, and they build out really nice-looking video slideshows to music. So they do beat detection. Uh, these uh, things sweep in, and they sweep out, and create amazing videos. Go and check them out. And this is their usage. Uh, so this is way back in 2008. Um, you can see that they're, they're sort of dribbling along as they were getting started. Uh, uh, at around uh, 10 to 20 uh, servers that they were running against. And this inflection point here is when they launched their Facebook app. So they took, uh, made it really easy for people to just click a button, install that app onto their Facebook page, take their Facebook photos, and go off and generate these really pretty videos, and then share them back to their friends. And you can see just how uh, severe that inflection is and how unpredictable it was. They had no idea whether this Facebook app was going to be successful or not, uh, but it certainly was. Uh, so they scaled up to uh, around 3,500 instances uh, in just a couple of days. Now, if they had had to provision that uh, in a statically provisioned infrastructure, that would have been a huge capital expense. And if they weren't running in the cloud, I can't imagine that there's a way that they would have been able to deliver on that opportunity, to deliver on that demand. Uh, their service simply would have been over capacity, and they wouldn't have had the success. So Animoto is still doing great work today. They've added a whole bunch of features, such as HD video. They've taken advantage of our GPU-enabled instances, and they're doing amazing work. So just like Animoto, for all companies, this large upfront investment uh, can be a real killer to innovation. You know you've got an amazing idea that can add significant value to your business. You know you've got a, an amazing problem that you can solve uh, in scientific research. If only you had the resources, if only you had the storage and the infrastructure to do so. But you can't get the large upfront investment uh, because it may not work out, or you simply don't have the funds available. Well, in the cloud, we just have zero upfront. 
Uh, so there's no capital spend. We run an entirely operational model. And companies such as Zynga, who build out uh, popular social games, uh, Farmville, some of you may be uh, familiar with, that runs on the web and on the app, uh, on, the, uh, on um, social networks and in the app stores, um, uh, run on AWS. The same thing with uh, Playfish. Uh, these guys were recently purchased by, uh, by Electronic Arts, and they're 100% running on AWS. This is a startup that went from nothing a uh, couple of founders and a couple of engineers to being a very, very large organization, uh, delivering games such as Madden, such as The Sims 3, and eventually being purchased, uh, um, uh, facilitated by the cloud. They couldn't have done this. They wouldn't have been able to drive their own business and drive the value through the games that they create uh, without the cloud. And the same more locally with Spotify. Spotify run their recommendations uh, on AWS as well. So traditionally, if they wanted to take advantage, if they wanted to run these sort of services, uh, whether it's Yelp or Spotify or Netflix, they would have had to buy out this huge IT infrastructure. Then they would have had to hire the people to manage it. They would have had to negotiate the support contracts and uh, the ongoing contracts of those people and the uh, IT provisioning. They would have had to manage it as it was running. And then after probably three to five years, they would have had to upgrade the whole thing for more cost. And they would have been back at, at the beginning. So this sort of traditional model, the traditional statically provisioned model, uh, doesn't work. You can see that there's nothing here on building out uh, restaurant recommendations. There's nothing here on increasing uh, advertising revenue. There's nothing here which is the core of most people's businesses. But it's something that everybody has to do if you want to operate at the sort of scale or any sort of scale, uh, such as Playfish or Zynga. In the cloud, we move from that model to try starting to provide IT that enables these things. So removing the need for capital expense, that's just gone. Providing higher availability applications because you can build for failure in this elastic environment. Large cost savings, focusing on the core business, and critically, particularly uh, in the social world, in the mobile application world, building a faster time to market, getting those ideas out as quickly as possible. So how do we deal with your low utilization? Well, you only pay for what you use. Just like utility, uh, electricity, utility computing, uh, you only pay for what you use. And on top of that, uh, we have some other pricing innovations which allow our customers to drive their costs and optimize their costs for their particular use case. Uh, so we have three main prices. Uh, we have on-demand pricing, uh, which is the price that you pay for our resources if you just jump onto our website and start provisioning new servers. We have reserve capacity. Uh, this is perfect for uh, instances, perfect for services such as databases, which are going to be running uh, more than 50% of the time. And with reserve capacity, and there's a small upfront payment. And in return for that payment, uh, you reserve and guarantee that capacity for your service going forwards. And because that allows us to plan more efficiently, uh, we pass that saving back to our customers. So we'll actually lower the hourly rate of running that service on the cloud. So if you're running uh, anything for longer than 50% of the time, uh, it's much, much cheaper to use this reserve capacity. And finally, and uh, in my opinion, the most interestingly and uniquely to Amazon, uh, we have the spot market. So we drive these lower prices and we drive prices down uh, by maximizing the efficiency of our own data centers. Uh, so we do that uh, with a certain amount with uh, on-demand pricing. That fills up a certain amount of our capacity. Uh, an additional amount of our capacity is filled out with reserve capacity, so people reserving instances ahead of time. But we still have additional capacity. And we allow customers to uh, say what they would like to pay for that capacity. So we recompute, based on demand, uh, every hour the value of that capacity. And we allow our customers to bid against it. Uh, once the spot price comes beneath your bid price, we'll make that capacity available to you. Uh, the deal being that if the spot price goes above your bid price, we can take it back again. So you do have to architect for the fact that interruption can occur. And this is one of the graphs that we make available. All of this, uh, again, available both on the web and through a, a programmatic interface. And so you can see the fluctuation there of uh, running uh, on a spot market. And you can set your bidding strategy based on the historical values. So this is a, a remarkable way of getting a lot of compute power available to you uh, at a very, very low cost. Uh, so the savings here are between 50 and 60%, typically in the spot market. And uh, we have a partner uh, over in the US called Cycle Computing. Uh, they span up a large uh, uh, computational infrastructure uh, for a top five farmer uh, running at 30,000 cores. So 30,472 cores. Uh, they ran this for eight hours. And uh, we charge them a grand total of just, uh, just over 1000 bucks an hour. So this is a very, very large-scale infrastructure, uh, opening up the problem space, opening up the problem domain, 
uh, removing the restrictions uh, for, this, uh, for this pharma company uh, for a very, very low cost per hour. And this talks really to uh, the spikiness of use cases. Uh, so this is a financial services company. Uh, they build out their Monte Carlo simulations, uh, running their financial models. They need to do this uh, frequently to update their models so they can do high frequency, uh, high frequency trades on the market. And you can see just how spiky this utilization is. Sometimes it's super high, 1,500 cores or more. And other times, at the weekend, when the markets are shut, there's no utilization for it. Now, if this company had had to go off and provision this uh, in a statically provisioned environment, uh, they would have had to provision those 1,500 cores. And all the white space on this graph is, would have been the money that was wasted. That would have been uh, a really inefficient way of working because they only need that capacity, that full capacity, uh, what, uh, a couple of percent of the time. The rest of the time, that's just money that's being wasted. They now run this on AWS and uh, see significant cost savings. And in addition to that, we're able to remove the, uh, the static barrier, the static upper end, and scale up to even more cores. So they reduced their runtime from 24 hours down to just 20 minutes. So I wanted to touch on uh, security. Uh, security is something of a, a, a hot topic uh, in the world of the cloud at the moment. And it's something that Amazon uh, take very, very seriously. And we have a pretty long uh, background and history in working with. Obviously, uh, the retail side of our business deals with a lot of uh, personally identifiable, sensitive credit card information. So it's something that uh, is really part of our, of our core. And this may be uh, the most uh, important slide that I show. So security in the cloud uh, is a shared responsibility. Uh, so whilst Amazon takes the responsibility of securing the infrastructure, that's basically everything from the foundations of our data centers all the way up to the hypervisors of our virtual machines, our customers undertake to the security of the applications and the operating systems that run on that capacity and the data that resides within them. So it's up to our customers to supply um, secure applications. It's up to our customers to decide on the level of encryption, for example, which is necessary to meet their own certification and regulatory requirements. We have no visibility into how our customers are using our service. We have full uh, administrative access, and we give you the private key. So we can't see into the operating system of what you're running. We have no responsibility thereof. So this shared responsibility model is really important. And given the flexibility of the service, where you can run any database that you want, you can run any set of tools that you like. This is really the only way that it can work. So we have full requirement-based access to our physical infrastructure. Nobody gets anywhere near our racks without having a very good reason. And those reasons are audited both internally and externally. And we have pretty high levels of certification in our data centers as well. So we're ISO 27001 compliant, and we have SAS 70 Type 2 control objectives. And as of September, we also introduced uh, service organization controls, or SOC 1. Uh, to these standards. So this gives even greater visibility to customers into how we're securing our infrastructure and how we certify against that. We have PCI DSS Level 1 compliance. This is a payment processing standard. And again, this is a really good example of building out this shared responsibility model. So whilst the infrastructure is certified to PCI DSS Level 1, if you want to reach that certification throughout your stack, you have to certify the application which runs on top of that infrastructure. And here are some of the control objectives that we certify against our own internal security organization, how we handle uh, our chain of command internally, the employee lifecycle, background checks, the logical and physical security of our servers and our infrastructure, secure data handling, the environmental safeguards in our data centers, fire suppression systems and this sort of thing, change management, data integrity, uh, incident handling, and the availability and redundancy of our services as well. So uh, S3, for example, our simple storage service, has 11 nines of data durability. This is a highly fault-tolerant, highly available uh, service, and we have certification about how we try and achieve that. In terms of geographic uh, regions, uh, we have a number of different regions. So the yellow circles on this map represent uh, what we call infrastructure regions. Uh, these are made up, uh, these are where our compute and our storage reside. Uh, we have seven of these regions, uh, three over on the west coast of the US, one on the east coast uh, in Dublin, in Europe, and in uh, Tokyo and Singapore as well. And the blue dots here represent our points of presence. So these are um, our data centers which are specifically built up for edge caching. Uh, so you can host your data, for example, over on the west coast of the US, uh, but if it's being accessed over in the Asia Pacific region, we'll make sure that we copy it over through our content delivery network so that people have a lower latency, faster download speeds over there as well. So um, inside each of these regions, 
uh, we actually have what we call availability zones. And availability zones uh, contain one or more data centers, which are geographically separated. They're redundantly connected. They're redundantly powered. They have redundant um, uh, service providers for their internet, for example. And uh, you can take advantage of these uh, to deploy your applications in a fault-tolerant way. So you can even mitigate, just as a startup, as a three-person startup, you can mitigate for the fact of entire data center failure or entire availability zone failure by deploying your application across these availability zones. And with a service like S3, the simple storage service, we replicate data between these availability zones automatically uh, to make sure that we can achieve these very, very high levels of data durability. However, data always stays local. Uh, so we do not mirror data between these individual geographic regions. You can do that yourself if you want, but there's very good certification and regulatory reasons, for example, why data uh, which is stored uh, in Europe wouldn't want to move across to the US. So uh, you actually can't put data up onto the cloud without making the decision about where it resides, and it always stays local. We have data access control, uh, so you always retain ownership of the data which is up in the cloud, and you have fine, uh, uh, fine grained access uh, controls around who can have access to it, whether it is completely private uh, or whether it is completely open. You can have named accounts uh, limited by the time of day or IP address and all that sort of thing. And we also have a service called the Virtual Private Cloud, which goes a step further and allows you to create any virtual network topology up in the cloud. So if you are dealing with public and private subnets, you can take your existing IP address ranges, move that up into a network isolated region in the cloud, and you can extend your existing IPsec virtual private network up into the cloud as well. So you can take your existing access control policies, your existing management policies, and apply those to the elastic infrastructure up in the cloud. If you want to read more about this, uh, I can recommend two uh, security white papers. We have one on risk and compliance, one as an overview of our security processes. Uh, they're about 15 pages each. Uh, they're well worth a read. Uh, they're an easy read written in clear English. Uh, you can download them, put them on your Kindles, read them on your morning commute. So what's next for Amazon? Um, so another thing that we inherited from our cousins in retail is uh, our focus on the customer. So we listen very closely, and my entire job is to listen very closely to what our customers are saying and take that feedback and innovate on them. And here are some of the messages that we've been receiving from our customers over the last couple of years. They want more regions. They want more geographic areas that, they pro that we provide our services in. And we've been listening to that. Uh, we provided a new region, US West, uh, in Portland, uh, which opened up uh, probably about uh, three or four weeks ago, and also a new GovCloud. So this is specifically tailored uh, for US federal use. Uh, but actually, interestingly, it's identical in all ways but one to all of our other regions. Uh, so it is FISMA moderate, just like all of our other regions. Uh, but in order to use it and in order to reach uh, the ITAR, the International Treaty of Arms uh, regulations, uh, we have to limit that to US citizens. So only US citizens work there, and only US citizens can access it. So that's the only region where you can't get immediate access, uh, but we are able to reach this higher level of utilization. So more regions. They also want lower prices. And we continually strive to improve our efficiencies to deliver that. So we've had about 16 drops uh, in the past five years without any real competitive pressure to do so, based on our own internal efficiencies. We reduced all inbound, we removed the price for all inbound data traffic. And this is primarily driven by people that wanted to work with very, very large data sets. So high energy physics, genomics, uh, they wanted to be able to get their data sets up there, collaborate around them, uh, move the, uh, the compute to the data once it's up there. And so we would just remove the inbound traffic costs. And if you do have large data sets that you want to work with, uh, we also provide an import-export service. Uh, so if you have a limited connectivity locally, you can just stick that data onto a large USB drive, uh, ship it to us. You should never underestimate the, uh, the bandwidth of a FedEx box. We'll load that into S3 or into our compute service uh, where you can take advantage of it. And then we're pretty good at shipping things around the world, so we'll send you the disk back. And you can get the data out in the same way. So if you have even a large amount of data that you've generated in the cloud or that you want to pull off the cloud uh, for any reason, uh, you can just send us a disk. We'll load it onto there and ship it back to you. Uh, if S3 uh, isn't working out for you, for example, we hope it does. But if it's not, you can just delete that data, and there's no ongoing requirement. So we, try and re we remove the, uh, the lock-in of using these services uh, as well. People want these services to be easier to use, uh, so we launched the Relational Database Service, which allows you to spin up Oracle and MySQL databases with a single click. 
Cloud formation, which allows you to specify full operational stacks uh, in a JSON, a functional language. And Elastic Beanstalk, which is built specifically for Java web applications. All you have to do there is upload uh, your Java WAR file, and uh, Elastic Beanstalk will take care of provisioning the rest of the infrastructure for you. So much, much easier to use, lowering the barrier even further of getting started, and lowering the barrier of running these services, lowering the cost of running, running these services later on. We also have a lot of requests for new instance types. And I think last week, even, uh, we announced uh, the second generation of our high-performance computing offering. Uh, we call it Cluster Compute 2. Uh, so we have a range of physical infrastructure that you can take advantage of, uh, from a relatively small reserved instance, which is perfect for uh, scale-out uh, uh, websites and such, adding more memory, more CPU, all the way up to our Cluster Compute instances, which are our fire-breathing high-performance service Cluster Compute uh, takes that a step further. So there's uh, 16 cores apiece in these. Uh, they operate at a very, very high spec. And before we open this up to the public uh, on, on Monday, uh, we actually lashed all our, some of our fleet of CC2 instances together, uh, benchmarked it, and submitted it to the top 500 list of supercomputers in the world. Uh, this is a list which is uh, uh, um, compiled every six months. And uh, we are at uh, number 42nd on that list. So this is a world-class supercomputer running at 240 teraflops that anybody can take advantage of. Anybody with a credit card can spin up this sort of infrastructure and operate uh, with the best in the world uh, in terms of compu computational resource. That's a really good example of the transformative approach that we're taking and enabling customers. Building out these sort of infrastructures isn't cheap. And now anybody can take advantage of them and pay for an hourly rate. And our services, uh, we, people also want to expand our services up and out. And we've done that with a range of new updates uh, from Route 53, our DNS service, Direct Connect, which gives you full, dedicated 1 gig and 10 gig uh, networking directly into our data centers, to the simple email service for bulk email delivery. And uh, I checked on our, on our announcement blog. We're rolling out about eight uh, updates on major new services every month. So we really want to keep up this rate of innovation on behalf of our customers, drive additional value for their businesses. And uh, with that, uh, if you want to read about more about what we're doing, uh, we're available at aws.amazon.com. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Could we have some lights so we can see the audience? <clears throat> and see if we have questions for the speakers. I can start with a question. Um, <clears throat> Okay, you talked a lot about openness, uh, openness in the internet, and th there's some sort of a feeling of, of a Western, maybe Anglo-Saxon concept of openness. And uh, <clears throat> the companies mentioned were mostly American. Uh, right now we have more internet users in Asia than in the US and Europe. How will Asian culture influence or change the internet, or even a, the concept of openness? So, um, I actually did my best not to be completely uh, focused on, on uh, the US. I'm not sure. Uh, I want to be cautious about uh, claims, or, uh, on one hand, the claims on uh, Asian values as though there's a separate and distinct universe uh, that is itself coherent. I'm not sure that there is a single uh, uh, um, uh, framework. I think two things. First, the drivers that have driven the success of open innovation on the net have, uh, have their foundations, I think, in the economics of innovation, not necessarily in the reflection of, of value. I think one of the things that, that one of the tensions that you see between, uh, so in, in China, for example, in mm -hmm. particular, is between the fact that the same kind of openness that's very good for innovation is also potentially politically disruptive. And you see the tension there. So I'm not sure whether that's a question of cultural values or a question of political uh, tension. Uh, but I think as a practical matter, uh, it's going to be very hard for any system that tries to keep up in terms of innovation to remain really closed. And that means that it has to balance the tension 
between the openness it needs in order to participate in global innovation and the, uh, uh, and the will to uh, constrain. But if you look at, at, um, um, if you look at Android development, Right. Mm. It's from the U.S., but manufacture obviously is uh, in East Asia. Uh, I, I, I suspect that it's actually the the, um, the imperative of continuous innovation is going to be driving an open framework, even in the teeth of potential political opposition, um, and that the primary threat is actually the threat to openness is not from a resistance to the idea of social and political openness as much as it is, is the resistance from uh, incumbents everywhere, including mm. in the US, including in Europe, to losing points of control. And that's much more of the tension. Mm -hmm. Do we have some questions? Maybe it was late yesterday. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> Matt, you, you talked about uh, spot market. Mm -hmm. Um, have universities spotted the spot market? Yes, absolutely. So, um, scientific and technical computing is actually an excellent fit for the spot market. Mm. And we have a whole bunch of use cases uh, that we see there. Um, it's a great fit for time insensitive, large scale computation. And this is exactly what universities uh, mm. want. Uh, it doesn't really matter if it runs today, tomorrow, or the end of the week, uh, but they want to optimize for a lower, lower cost. And so the spot market allows them to pay exactly uh, what they want for their computational resources, and then it just runs when the, when the price is there. So uh, running, uh, whether it's um, uh, driving collaborative filtering, whether it's running bioinformatics tasks, uh, universities uh, really try and take advantage uh, of this lower cost model uh, whilst achieving this very, very large scale. Do we have brokers already? Uh, not to my knowledge. <coughs> Because I, I see that happen also in this, in this sector, then that, that you yeah, assemble a, different. Yeah, it's a very sports. it's a very interesting area uh, for these sort of utility markets. Okay, I leave you for your coffee break then, and uh, thank you very much thank for you. the morning session. Thank you.